Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our December 1st, 2021 Safety and Security Meeting. We have three of these a year. This is our fall gathering for this endeavor. Uh, I am Chris McCord, Assistant Superintendent for Operations. I'm happy to be here today to guide and shepherd us through this process. Uh, Dr. Knoll is at a leadership conference, so he was not able to be here. He sends his regards, so I will get us safely and successfully through this, and hopefully everyone can learn a lot and we can share. We do, as we said, we do these three times a year. We greatly appreciate you taking a few moments of your day to be a part of this, and uh, we're going to get rolling now. And so I hope everyone has had a chance to review the minutes as distributed from the uh, June 2nd, 2021 uh, gathering for the safety and security meeting. Are there any questions regarding the minutes from June 2nd at this time? Okay, I'm getting a lot of good. Uh, anyone, any questions? Okay, in that regard, uh, the next thing we would need to do would be to have a motion to accept those minutes. Is there a motion from our group to accept the minutes as presented from the June 2nd safety meeting? It's Mr. Moore, I move. Okay, we have a first by Mr. Moore. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. All right, Ethan Barton is our second. Any discussion regarding the June 2nd minutes from the safety and security meeting? Any discussion? Okay, uh, well then, if there's not any discussion, if all those in favor could maybe raise your right hand, we'll see. And it looks like that they're overwhelmingly accepted so great job, Mrs. Godfrey. If you can note that, that'd be great. We have accepted the minutes from the June 2nd meeting. So we've got a great lineup today. We're going to talk about things, and I think we're going to try to make this interesting. Uh, as always, we welcome questions, and we'll try to answer those questions to the best of our ability, while at the same time maintaining security or sort of sensitive information uh, as it might relate to the question. But we are here for you and batting lead off today to get us started is Captain Matt Blakelock, and he's going to be addressing uh, the Conroe ISD Police Department update. So Captain Blakelock. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for allowing me to give you a brief overview of the Conroe ISD Police Department today. The Conroe ISD Police Department's motto is that we safeguard the future today. We align with the district's mission by working in tandem with district management to ensure that we protect students, visitors, staff, and properties of the district. The police department has 81 full-time officer positions, 25 prevention control security monitors, six full-time 911 dispatchers, and 95 crossing guards at over 102 locations. Our officers are highly trained. It's something that we're very proud of. The Texas Commission on Law Enforcement requires that officers uh, receive 40 hours of continuing education training every two years, and we're proud to say that CISD PD officers receive well over 100 hours each year. Our training revolves around safety, professionalism, and emergency response. We are one of about 200 training providers in the state of Texas uh, out of over 2,700 law enforcement agencies, and we have over 20 certified police instructors. The Conroe City Police Department uh, was recognized first in 2014 by the Texas Police Chiefs Association uh, Best Practices Recognition Program. It is a program that's designed on a national accreditation for police departments. It has over 170 individual best practices that are designed to ensure efficient and effective delivery of police services while reducing risk and protecting uh, individual rights. We were, we were recognized, uh, the, the program recognizes an agency for four years, as long as they continue with constant audits and reporting. And we were recognized first in 2014, and then in 2018, and we are set to be re-recognized in 2022. Now we recognize that our success relies upon partnerships. Uh, we work and train with other law enforcement, fire and EMS agencies regularly. Uh, in and outside of our county. And an example of that is we provide active shooter training to many agencies in the greater Houston area. We also recognize that, that communities affect schools and schools affect communities. Uh, we invite other law enforcement into our schools to familiarize their officers with our campuses and with our officers, uh, to be an extra presence in and around our schools and to help, um, help our kids get to know them and their departments. 
We work hand in hand with our administrators uh, on campus concerns and safety planning and response, with our counselors in crisis intervention and support, and with district staff just to further the mission of our district. And we partner with students, parents, and the community because we realize that it takes everyone being involved to make our schools safe. As part of that, the police department offers a variety of safety programs. I've listed a few on the slide today. Uh, there is a multitude of training that we're able to put on for students, parents, uh, and the general public. Uh, we do that inside and outside of the schools. And we also operate a police activity league, which is a nonprofit run by the police department that provides a lot of mentorship and programs to CISD students. We offer summer camps, uh, student leadership program, uh, Kid Chat Anonymous tip line, uh, we are just wrapping up our Coats for Kids drive that we do starting every October and ending in November, closer to December, where we provide coats for kids who may not have one for the winter. And as we close that out, we're beginning our holiday gift drive now, which provides uh, Christmas for CISD students who may otherwise not have it. And we're able to provide Christmas for between 600 kids and 1,000 kids every year, which is pretty amazing. The majority of our officers work during the day and then also work extra duty for evening events. Uh, we are a 24 7, 365 day a year agency. Our officers and dispatchers work uh, day, evening, and nights. Our campus officers are assigned to all levels of campuses during the day. And we have evening high school officers uh, because there's so many activities that go on at high schools. We have provincial control security monitors at high schools that monitor the parking lot and the exterior of the campus. They are in constant communication with campus administration as well as the campus police officers. Uh, as I said, our patrol works day, evening, and night. We also have three full-time detectives, two narcotic sniffing canines, and one explosive sniffing canine. Uh, our campus and patrol officers are there to be a presence, to be visible during take-up, class changes, lunches, dismissal. They walk the halls, they check the doors, they challenge visitors. Uh, they do perimeter patrols either by walking, golf cart, patrol car and even bike patrol. Um, and our officers work very closely with administration on campus while interacting with students in a positive manner. Our dispatch is a 911 certified, they, they're all 911 certified emergency call takers. They work every day of the year, 24 seven. Um, they do many things, but the, the basis of what they do is they monitor alarms, they answer calls for service, they monitor the district's cameras, our kid chat and anonymous alerts tip lines, uh, and they monitor other law enforcement channels and communicate any concerns that might be going on in the community. Our investigators assist officers in criminal investigations and also serve as support on campus and at events. And our canine conduct daily random checks of all campuses and parking areas for drugs, firearms, and explosives. We believe in collaboration with the administration because everything that we do revolves around communication and a partnership with the campuses and district administration regarding any common threats, issues, or concerns that, that may be happening. That is a very basic overview. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Captain Blakelock, I have a question. Yes, sir. If I was a, if I was a police officer watching this YouTube or a citizen and I was, issue, I was interested in becoming a crossing guard or helping in some way, what would I need to do? Where would I go? What would I need to do? Uh, we are always welcoming applications for crossing guards. Uh, it's a very big program that we're running. Uh, you can contact the police department. Um, our phone number was, I, Ethan, was it on the last slide? Um, you can contact the right right. myself, or you can contact us at 936-709-8911. Uh, anyone interested could also go to the Conroe ISD website to the human resources page and fill out an online application. Not too late to drop off toys, is it? It is not too late to drop off toys. We're going to be running that program through up till December 17th. We are putting bins out at campuses and other district buildings. Um, there are trash cans that are decorated, and we fill them up and we empty them as fast as we can and as often as we can. Any questions for Captain Blakelock on the topic of the overall police force? Okay, well, we welcome questions. We're gonna keep going and we're gonna stay with Captain Blakelock for the next part. You probably saw some big news uh, a little while back regarding the Conroe ISD Police Department becoming a 
Public Safety Answering Point, also known as a PSAP, and that is PSAP. So, uh, Captain Blakelock, can you take us through that quickly, what we need to know as part of the safety committee? I can certainly do that. Uh, thank you for having me back. Um, so what is a PSAP? A PSAP, uh, like Mr. McCord said, is a public safety answering point. Anytime someone within Montgomery County calls 911, that call is routed to a PSAP based on the location of the call. So there are primary and secondary PSAPs. A primary PSAP is the one that will receive the initial 911 call. And they will either provide the service needed or they're going to transfer to a secondary PSAP. A secondary PSAP has the exact same equipment, capabilities, uh, but they don't initially answer the 911 call. So an example would be a 911 call goes to Conroe PD asking for police at a Conroe area uh, school campus. They would transfer the call to CISD PD through 911. Saves an immense amount of time in sharing information and getting officers where we need them. Another example would be a caller dialing uh, our district PD phone line directly uh, and they need fire or EMS. And that happens from time to time. We can then transfer that to 911 at the Woodlands Fire or Montgomery County Hospital District EMS. So in 2021, Montgomery County 911 asked CISD PD to become a secondary PSAP. Current PSAPs in Montgomery County, uh, Conroe Police Department and Montgomery County Sheriff's Office are the primary 911 PSAPs. And then you've got the Woodlands Fire Department for all fire department dispatching and Montgomery County Hospital District EMS as secondary PSAPs. As of October 2021, I'm proud to say that CISDPD is now a secondary PSAP as well. So what is the rationale for us uh, becoming a PSAP? One, we are the third largest law enforcement agency in Montgomery County. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, we are one of very few agencies that have a 24-7 dispatch center that already had the infrastructure in place to support being a 911 center. Uh, our schools and facilities reach over 348 square miles of the county. It is not unheard of for us to have 80,000 plus people on our campuses and facilities at any given time during school day. Uh, and we interact with 911 for police, fire, and EMS multiple times each day. Prior to becoming a PSAP, they calculated that at, a, at six plus times a day. Since becoming a PSAP, we now have more than doubled that. And we account for that not by more emergencies on campuses, but uh, better tracking, better ability to track those numbers. So what do we get out of uh, becoming a 911 public safety answering point? Uh, great news, Montgomery County 911 provided all of the equipment, the installation and ongoing maintenance at their cost. Um, we receive, and, and all of this are, are capabilities we did not have prior to this. We get what's called any and alley information, automatic number and automatic location identification. Whatever phone somebody calls from, cell phone or landline, it will tell us who the caller is and where they're calling from, which is hugely important for us. We also receive a telecommunication device for the deaf and a language line where we can translate any given number of languages um, spoken in our community. We get text to 911 capability, which we did not have prior. Uh, a lot of people will dial 911 through text as, as a preference or as a necessity, and we can now communicate with, with people that way. We receive an emergency backup location at, at the 911 center in Montgomery County. Should we ever have to leave this facility or there's something where our systems are not working here, we can transfer over to the 911 center and have virtually no interruption in services. We get access to Smart 911 that Montgomery County 911 provides. Smart 911 allows any citizen in Montgomery County to register their personal information if they have any medical information or property information that emergency responders might need. They can have that before arriving on scene. And part of that is also RAVE facility profiles that Ethan Barton's going to talk about in a little bit is basically the same thing, but for entities, for, for businesses and entities. We have RAVE facility profiles for our campuses at the district. And then lastly, we get uh, analytics and report capabilities. So we can see the number of calls, the emergency calls that come in, the type and um, the frequency of those calls. 
So who benefits? Um, Conroe ISD benefits our community and our citizens. Our services are, are being able, we're able to get officers on scene and get fire and EMS to locations a lot faster because of this. It strengthens an already great working relationship that we have with other emergency agencies. Um, Montgomery County 911 bears the cost of the equipment, installation, maintenance, and the training of our dispatchers. And Montgomery County 911 board approved this interlocal agreement in May of 2021, and the CISD Board of Trustees approved it uh, on June 15th, 2021. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions once again. Questions for Captain Blakelock regarding PSAP. Captain, like Smart 911, what example I could register like if I, if I had a dog or someone was diabetic at my house or what would be some examples of some things I would register? Those, those are actually really good examples. There are people that will register that they have um, dogs that are not friendly. There are people that will register that they have certain um, chemicals or things like that stored at their house legally. Um, people will most often list uh, medical conditions. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll list the locations of where certain people are in certain rooms. It's, it's quite open to be able to put the information in that, that you want emergency responders to know. What website do I go to to do that? I might actually be interested in doing that. If you go to Montgomery County, if you Google Montgomery County 911, um, it will take you to their site and you can, it'll, it'll show you how to start a profile. So I have a question about that, Captain Blakelock, because, you know, I think I've done that in the past, but my con my question then is, let's say I'm driving down the road and I'm witnessing an emergency and I'm dialing 911 to talk to them and let's say I lose the signal or whatever. If, if I understand the way the profile works, wouldn't they be sending someone to my house even though I'm not there? So what the first thing that they would do is, is it would show your profile. Um, However, if they weren't able to ascertain that it was your emergency, the great thing about the Annie and Allie information is they'll have your callback information and they'll immediately attempt to call you back. Um, if they aren't sure, they may send an emergency responder to your house, um, but odds are they're going to try to call you back and, and make contact with you uh, should the reception, should, should you lose reception. Thank you. Captain Blakelock to PSAP, it really didn't cost us much of anything, did it? There were minimal, minimal cost, uh, just upgrading some outlets and things like that. Um, we already possessed the, uh, the phone and radio recording equipment, the dispatch consoles, um, all of the things that we had to already be a 24-7 emergency dispatch. And so it was just bringing in the 911 equipment. Any other questions for Captain Blakelock regarding uh, public safety answering point? Okay. Captain Blakelock, we appreciate you. Someone may sprawl back and ask a question later. We appreciate your time. We're going to transition to Ethan Barden, our coordinator of school safety and hearing, hearing officer. And he is going to talk about another item that we use that has very limited cost, if any, and that is RAVE facility. So Ethan, take it away. All right. Appreciate it. And thank you all for being here again. Um, this and Captain Blakelock mentioned this and with them becoming the PSAP, but this is one thing that we've had in place uh, around four or five years, it's something that I, I just kind of stumbled upon and just found out recently that the county pays for it. But I had gone in four slash five years ago, whatever it may be, and built a profile for each one of our campuses and facilities um, within the district. And it's RAID facility, it's through Smart 911, but what it uses is geofencing. Um, and so every single facility that we have campus, and as you can see here, it's broken down by the blue part is the entire campus. And College Park is a great example of this because it's so spread out and large, big, huge campus. And then you break it down into individual buildings, main campus, athletics, and then down in the back where you have baseball and softball. And um, each 911 entity within the county or public service answering point PSAP is on there. We've submitted all of those and they've all been approved by 911. And yesterday, while we were working on this um, presentation and talking about it, 
county actually called about ours because I had questioned them. And so those have all been enabled as well and been approved. So we are good to go. The thing with this is, is the benefit of this, excuse me, is um, it's cellular based, of course. And so it doesn't matter with our um, IP phones. They're going to know exactly where that location is coming from. However, if we do have 911 calls that are placed on or in our buildings or on our properties or whatnot, it's going to be able to allow the police, first responders or whatever to know that that cell phone call is coming from one of our facilities or one of our properties. And so um, just to give you a little bit of a, a better visual of it, um, this is what it actually looks like within the system. And sorry, it had logged out. And so we'll just go back. And as you can see, you know, all of our campuses and facilities are in there. And if I'm going too fast, I apologize for making spats or your eyes messed up. But as College Park, it's got everything in there, status, basic info, map, buildings, people, resources, and then your 911 call centers. But as you go in, it just gives you your, your global view. And then I just went in and geofenced each particular individual location within there. And then um, at the very end, without showing the information that's in there about it, it just goes through, it shows you each individual um, piece app that you go through. And now all of those are active. So if anybody were to dial 911 in one of our buildings um, within that geofence, it would pretty much give them a precise location. Is that not correct, Captain Blakelock? That is correct. Okay. And so um, that is, and as Mr. McCord said, minimal cost. Actually, the only thing it costs is time to put all those in there. And then, of course, if those calls come in, it's going to just going to increase communication, increase response time. And then not only that, it's going to be able to, give them direction to respond uh, to a specific area, you know, due to a volume of calls or where it's coming from. Um, is there any questions or any input that you guys have in regard to that? I know it's a quick overview, um, but without going too far into depth, it's just one more layer that we have to um, help out anybody that's gonna have to respond to our campuses should there be an emergency. Any questions for Mr. Martin regarding Ray facility? So Ethan and Captain, you have pretty good synergy between the PSAP and RAID facility. Uh, yeah, and it's it's it was just kind of an odd thing that, you know, they became the PSAP. And this was already kind of working in the background or it had been working. And so the two things just kind of married together. And it's actually, it's really cool. And again, it's something that the county has paid for. So really, it's just us inputting the information. And in, I mean, hopefully nothing really, really bad ever happens. However, something like this could benefit us tremendously when it comes to um, the information that it could provide. And you know what the, the funny note is, um, until we became a PSAP, we would not even have access to our own RAID facility profiles through their, through their system as an emergency agency. So us becoming a PSAP and then now having that additional information is fantastic for us. Any other questions for Ethan? We're good for questions. If not, we're going to transition to Mr. Muir, Steve Muir and from School Safety. And he's going to talk, we've talked about the importance of communication and, you know, events in the country constantly show us how important it is to be able to communicate when something goes awry. And uh, we've got a great plan and doing some things to make it even better. And so Mr. Muir is going to talk about BDA systems and what they are, why they're important and how they work and what we're doing. It's a good segue with what Ethan and um, Matt have said earlier, because once we make a call, and gets out there that we need help in the building for whatever reason, be it fire, be it EMS, or be it uh, police department, we've got to be able to communicate once we get inside our buildings. And the example that's showing up on the screen is a high-rise building, because that's what the most examples you see of those are. But a lot of times when you get into a school facility or a large complex, the radios that the police department, fire department, EMS, other first responders carry operate off a county system. And they sometimes will run into signal disruption inside the building due to cinder block, due to a lot of steel in that building. So now with the uh, life safety code that's been adopted by Montgomery County Fire Department and uh, in local areas, we're required to have a BDA when there's a certain size building. And that's gonna fit all of our campuses right now. And what a BDA does basically is there's an antenna on top of our building that grabs a signal from the county 800 megahertz system, pulls it inside and then distributes it out. And the reason it's called a BDA is it's a bi-directional. 
it'll boost that signal as it comes in, then it'll boost the signal of the first responder once he's or she are in the building and send it back out. So we've got good, clean communication with that. Uh, it's going to help a whole bunch just being able to do that. Actually, when they come through and do inspections of our buildings after we've completed them, they divide the building up to 20 by 20 grids, 20 foot by 20 foot grids and test that. The fire marshal and the hospital district come out and test that. And we get a good chance, a good feel for where we are. And if we need to move some of the amplifiers around, some of the equipment around, they do that. They tweak it at that point in time. And a lot of this came out after 911. As you can imagine, there was a lot of problems with the communications we learned in that and other emergency incidents after 911. But the city of Houston, Montgomery County, and Harris County came together and made a 800 megahertz system available to us. We're lucky to be a part of that. And not only is our PD part of that, our transportation system also works off that county system. So we've got coverage all over the 348 square miles of Conroe ISD, all over Montgomery County, probably up into Walker County, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, and we know into Harris County. So if we take a bus and go to a, an event at, in Cy Fair, we're going to have coverage and be able to talk to each other. So those are some things that have come out of this. But basically that BDA, what it does is it lets us signal, get signal in and out where there would have been dead spots in the building, much like you'd use in a cell phone in a, in a school building. That's that. That said, you know, it is a, fan, a mandate by the fire marshal. They're going to come in and to get a certificate of occupancy. We're going to have to do that, but it, it's a it's a good thing to do. What we're doing is we're putting in all new construction, and as we touch campuses on the life safety uh, school safety package, we're updating those campuses that we do upgrades to them. Like College Park, for example, is going to have one as it goes in. Uh, and as we build new facilities, we'll do the same thing, and we've got plans for all this. At the same time, we did this. We found that. Uh, our campuses were having trouble with their, their digital radios, walkie talkies that the assistant principals or principals use for safety during the day. So at the same time, we're running an amplification system for those digital radios to give us good coverage in those buildings at the same time, because we can save uh, scale of uh, economy of scale because we can run that conduit and run those antennas at the same time. So we've done a lot of those things too. So we, we feel real good about where we're headed with this. And it makes us a whole lot safer in the long run in, in the event something bad happens on a, in a facility. Any questions? Mr. Mr. Muir, that would not be accessible if I'm just a student or a staff member in the building. That's for first responders and buses and such, correct? Right. That's going to take, it's basically there's an 800 megahertz system that they operate off of. It's going to take the transmission from that radio, pop it out to the building on top, and then send it to the towers that are around the county and right off that county system. No, so it's not it's not a cell phone repeater system uh, that we're using that for. We're using it for first responder radios. Any questions from Mr. Muir regarding BDA systems? All right, that's exciting, Steve. That's a game changer. Thank you for taking the time to share that with us. We're going to transition and throw it back to Mr. Barden, coordinator of school safety and hearing officer. He's going to give us a quick review of safety drills for the 21-22 school year. Of course, and as we had said, or we talked about before in light of recent events and then even our severe weather that we had not too long ago, um, drilling is an all important thing. Just wanted to make sure that the committee understood what it is that we do is in regard to our required drills and their frequency, you know, by the state and such. And so, um, of course, we're required our fire evacuation drills, which are required by the state one for every 10 school days. And so essentially it equates to around 10 a school year once a month. Um, lockout drills is one per school year. Our lockdown drills are one per semester or twice a year. Um, evacuate, which essentially is the same thing as a fire evacuation, is one per school year just to make sure that you can quickly move students out of the building. Um, our shelter in place, severe weather and hazmat, which is the one that we got a freebie not too long ago because of the weather, where everybody pretty much had to go into shelter in place for various reasons, tornadoes, tornado watch, et cetera. Um, those are one per school year. Um, a hold, which is recently new, as you all for the committee know, when we've uh, refreshed, updated our um, our MEOP that was added in as part of the standard response protocol. And that's essentially just if there's a medical emergency in the building, just making sure that we're, we have the ability to make sure that everybody holds in place and we're not 
having people come out into, into a hallway in a situation where they don't need to be in the middle of. Um, reverse evacuation, we require those. It's not by the state, but we require them. Um, just making sure that when you have kids outside that you can quickly and efficiently get them back inside the building. So just make sure that you have a plan in place in order to make sure that that happens. Um, and then of course, tabletop drills, um, we, don't, we don't necessarily require them, we recommend them. And then we also provide um, a lot of resources for our administrators to go and look through folders to be able to, to go through and do any type of tabletop situation that, that you can dream of that are in there. Um, and then we have a lot of those resources for them to do. And then of course they can use them as a guide and, and really just kind of make up any situation that they would like and be able to tabletop it just to kind of um, get their drilling a little bit better um, and how they're gonna respond to things and, and multi-hazard incidents. So just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that we're doing those required drills. Um, and we do have a system in place of accountability um, within our SSO system to be able to check that and ensure that we are completing all of those drills. Um, and I actually went through them all today and we're actually looking really good as a district in regard to making sure that those are done for um, what, what is gonna be required at the semester. So um, does anybody have any input, any questions about drills, things that you feel that maybe we should be doing that are not on this list that would be outside of what are required by the safety center in the state, anything like that? All right, Mr. Barton, we appreciate it. Please stay on top of that. We know how important they are, especially in a lot of recent events, so way to go. We're going to transition to Michael Ferguson, our, our safety specialist, who I believe he may actually be out on the road with the fire marshal today coming to us from his vehicle, but I'm not sure. He's going to give us input regarding fire marshal yeah. inspections, which is a big, big deal this year. Uh, this is an active year for him and campus and facility safety audits, what they are and what we're doing. Mr. Ferguson, take it away. Yeah, I, I am in my vehicle. We just finished up over here at College Park. I hope my signal's okay. I was trying to find a place. I couldn't find a place quiet, so I just jumped in the truck. Um, but uh, uh, we completed fire inspections for, uh, as you can see, uh, it looks like about 37 schools, 38 schools. We're just, we have one more tomorrow, which is at the Woodlands. Uh, and then, you know, uh, so we will be done with all the uh, schools outside in the county. We still haven't done any schools within Conroe city limits. That's a different fire marshal. Um, some of the items that we're addressing that we're finding at all the places that we're going, uh, the storage is too high, which, you know, we've already talked, we talk about that with our, 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 uh, our principals building uh, administrators um, whenever we do the safety audits. Uh, you know, wall coverings at 50% of the walls within a classroom. Uh, not including bu uh, bulletin boards or anything like that. Uh, power strips as opposed to um, surge protectors, there is a difference and we're starting to educate everybody on that. And then daisy chaining them, uh, having multiple strips into one outlet, using extension cords as um, uh, permanent wiring. And then uh, fabrics in the classroom, we, we're addressing the, uh, uh, the fact that they need to be treated with a, a flame retardant material or have a, a certificate on it that says that they're being treated, that they have been treated. So that's just some of the stuff that we're covering with these uh, fire inspections. Um, the next uh, slide would be the uh, safety audits. And, and what we're doing this year with the fire inspections, we haven't had them in a while uh, due to COVID and other, other issues, we're integrating them together. So any school, that's going to have a safety audit that also has a fire inspection. We're using both of those together in order to maximize the administrator's time. Um, so after the, the fire inspection, we schedule a, a time that we can go in there and then we I'll conduct an intruder assessment, you know, try to try to find a way to get into the building and then see how long it takes for anybody to recognize that I'm there, you know, don't have a badge on. Um, and then I'll, some of that stuff we'll go over. We'll review the MEOP. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, some other things that we talk about. We talk about the employees having their badges, door security, not only the exterior doors, but the classroom doors as well. And then uh, we talk about the reunification plans and, you know, make sure that they have multiple plans, not just one based on their campus. Um, some of the things that we touched on. Um, again, you know, just to go back to it, we talked about this before, but 
the, the stuff on the left is, is actually stacked too high. Uh, the fire code actually says 18 inches on anything that has automatic sprinkler system. As a district, we go a little bit over that. We go 24 because we have portable buildings and we have other places that don't have uh, automatic sprinkler systems. So just to make it easy, we just say 24 across the board. And as you can see, the pictures on the right show that. Next one, Ethan. We're there, Mark. Is everybody there? Is I, I'm, I'm out. Oh, yeah, okay. I think you were lagging. So, I'm bit. sorry. That's all good. So this, this one is showing um, on the left, you can see the daisy chain happening from surge protector to surge protector. On the right, it's showing it properly done. But more importantly, it shows the distinction of what a power, uh, what a surge protector is, not a power strip. If you can see on the top of that, there's a little black bump. That is actually a fuse. And that, that fuse will pop before anything else happens with that surge protector. And if there's any questions and I can get them, I will definitely answer them for you uh, if you have any uh, uh, suggestions or any input. Yeah, and I know oftentimes we talk about, I mean, if there's anything that you feel, you know, at, at your, on your daily job here at school building or when you're visiting or whatnot, if there's anything that you feel that we need to add, expand upon or anything to these, not to the fire marshals, because that's not to us, but to the safety audits for things that we're looking at. I guess to better test us or test our facilities, et cetera. Um, we would we would definitely enjoy that. Not the feedback, but just hearing from you all on what it is that we could be doing. I have a question for Mr. Ferguson. This is Mr. Moore. Um, are we yes, using are our are, are reunification plans? Are they based on the Texas School Safety Center K-12 reunification plan, or is that a little too generic? Have we really gone in and, and customized them for our use? You mean to answer it, Fergus? Yeah, go ahead, Ethan. So it's that way it doesn't lag. So uh, a few a few years ago, um, I intend I attended it was an I love you guys training, which is where the standard response protocol comes from, and it was specifically two to three. It was three days, but two full days, pretty much based upon the standard response protocol. And so I took all of that, and I'll just kind of put it all in a nutshell. And there's one thing that I took from that, and he told us. He goes, you can buy a kit, you can buy binders, and you can provide things that for every campus in order so that they have a reunification plan sitting in front of them. He said, but the biggest thing with those, plan those plans is they need to collect fingerprints and not dust. And so the, big, the meetings that we have, and when I talk with our safety APs, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, these reunification plans, they're necessary and they're needed, and you need to put a lot of thought in them but it's not something that we can give you. You need to take it down. It needs to be campus specific. It needs to have your campus people's names in it. They, and everybody needs to know what they're doing. And then every single year, it needs to be taken off the shelf and the dust needs to be taken off of it to make sure that that plan is gathering fingerprints. Um, I feel that we do a pretty good job of that we have over the past few years um, due to uh, making sure that we can go in and see that not only the MLP is being looked at, but we inserted a, a section within there where they have to place in their campus specific reunification plans. And one thing that Ferguson and I have been doing is not auditing them, for instance, but we go through and we look at them and we just, we make sure that, that they're campus specific and they're not just kind of taking information and saying, this is my reunification plan. So I feel as a district, we're in a pretty good place. I know that we're in a better place than we were. We were with them four to five years ago. And I mean, of course, there's always room to grow, but I feel we're doing a pretty good job. And I hope that that answered your question. Yes, that was the answer I was hoping to get because I've looked at that standard response protocol and, and found it to be very generic. And I was hoping that we really had put a lot of time into to custom. Yeah, planning, and so. oddly enough, it's generic on purpose and right. for a reason. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that that effort y'all put into it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, any other questions? Anybody? Mr. Ferguson, we appreciate you presenting today along with our other uh, cast and crew. We appreciate your efforts. Just FYI, we're looking at our next meeting, Omicron willing, uh, occurring on March 29th, the afternoon of March 29th in person up here at the boardroom. 
Uh, the, the start time might be 3.30 and maybe 4. We'll see what happens and how things go between now and then. But currently, that is our goal, and it would be our spring. Remember, we have three a year, and so obviously this is our one for the fall. And so, uh, hey, we had a great meeting today. I appreciate, appreciate the questions, your continu continuing efforts. Anything else before we sign off? Anyone? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Stay safe out there. We appreciate you.